G'day, Tony. Welcome to Landscape Photography World. How's your day going? It's very good, thanks, mate. Just starting off with a bit of a cold wind outside, but as I said to you earlier, I do enjoy that, so that's fine. Nice. So I'm really pleased to have you on the show. It's You've been in, in my sights for a little while. Why don't you tell people that don't know, because it, I, I'm lucky enough to have a, a fairly international audience, so there's people from the US and Canada and the UK that I know listen and also New Zealand, of course. So there might be some people out there that haven't heard of you. I know most of the Aussies will probably know your work. But why don't you tell them who you are and why you got started in landscape photography? Well, I started in wedding photography, strangely enough, about not that strange, I suppose a lot of photographers do, but that was going back over 30 years ago. Yep. And uh, I did that for a thousand weddings, which was a good wow. ground, grounding in training on the job, if you like, because mm -hmm. as anyone who's done weddings would know, you're pretty much getting training in everything from fashion to landscape, to food, to jewellery, to people, to portrait, to documentary, yeah. etc. So that kept me going. And of course, in that field, you have to do the job, whether it's raining, whether it's windy, whether it's hot whatever it is you've got to do it so you become a very good at, at problem solving in terms of photography sure uh, you get used to gear that fails you you have to figure ways around all that so it's a really good training ground that evolved into a portrait business um, a lot of our early portrait business and, and ongoing portrait business came out of that wedding uh, base that we had mm -hmm. and along the way I was picking up commercial work so first 15 20 years I suppose there was a good mix of wedding portrait, commercial, and like many photographers, even today, but certainly back then, when you went traveling, you liked the idea of shooting a bit of landscape and a bit of travel, which yeah. I did. And uh, about the mid to early 2000s, I suppose I started taking more interest in landscape. When I was traveling, I was looking at how I could produce things that might go on a wall. I was inspired by the, the people like the like Ken Duncan's of the world, Steve Parrish. And then mid to later in the 2000s, I came across people like Christian, who has become a, has become a very close friend. That's Christian Fletcher. Yep, yep. And that kind of kept me looking at how landscape worked and how it was something I could do for myself, whereas wedding portrait was very much about photographing for other people. Although you're bringing yourself to the job or to the project, you, you've still got in mind what do they want, what are they looking for, it's going on their walls and it's about them yeah. whereas landscape was a little bit more about this is how i see the world this is my world this is what i like and i don't have to photograph what i don't like yeah and so it's interesting when we think of landscape in terms of documenting or recording something versus landscape as an ex form of expression if you like yeah. and we'll probably get into the conversation around this photography art a little later but for me, it was always, landscape was always more than just recording because I was always in a space where I was taking photographs of something that it was more about how I was feeling about where I was rather than I'm there for a purpose to, to take back a you know, particular record. Yeah, sure, sure. So, yeah, that moved me into landscape and then very quickly it evolved into trying to produce landscapes that were a little different and a little more expressive. I've always had an interest in in the arts in terms of painting so people like Monet, Turner, mm -hmm. Matisse, these sort of artists and legends, they inspired me as to it was more than what I see. There's more to it than just what's in front of you. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, then having the privilege of mixing with other photographers uh, along the way. But yeah, that that kind of led me to where I am today, where I exhibit, I've had whatever, 10 or 11 solos. I work with a, a gallery called Linton and Kay, which have several spaces. And every couple of years we do an exhibition and I've done a few bigger ones, solo projects such as Girt by Sea and things like that. Mm -hmm. And of course, I've been heavily involved over the last 25 years in, in awards programs around the world, within Australia certainly, but also overseas, both in terms of an entrant and then through to judging and chairing judging and running competitions and coordinating and things like that. So sure. It also exposed me, exposes me to lots of different things trends different styles genres and ways that people approach different types of photography pretty blessed in the influences i've had around me 
And as a result, my work now is very much, it's where I've come to in photography, but it's also what I've brought with me is who I am as a person and what I liked as a kid. Sure. My strengths in mathematics and science and music all come through in my work, or at least I hope they do. And a lot mm. of people recognize that. And yeah. So by the way, Grant, you'll know I can talk. So I'll, <laughs> I'll try to keep the answers short. <laughs> oh, uh, you don't need to. This is a long form <laughs> podcast. I'm, I'm more than happy. I, I came for about an hour ish. But okay. I've had plenty that go well over the hour. And for me, it's not a problem. It's down to the listener whether or not they're. They're yeah, engaged that's, right. they that's exactly it. I'm, I'm here all ears. I'm, I'm definitely uh, keen to keen to delve, or I guess, into the motivational and inspirational side of things. And I guess for me, it's, it's really around what is it about the landscape that sort of engages that creativity for you? As you said, it already started as. I guess more of an art form and something that's more expressive than just recording your travels and so forth. What is it that makes you go, okay, that makes a good shot. That's really makes me feel something. How do you take that expression of how you're feeling and put that into what you're, what you're trying to capture? I think what I've discovered over the years is that, there's an innate part of each of us that wants to be heard. And it's about, it involves things like pattern recognition and code breaking. I know that might yep. sound weird, but no. know, looking at the landscape and it involves phenomenons like pareidolia, where we look at clouds and we see rabbits and horses. You know? yep. I think for me, when I'm looking, our brain, see, the thing is that our brain does the seeing, not our eyes. The eyes is just an instrument, like a lens that captures the information, but the brain interprets that information and does all the seeing. And the seeing is based on what's already in our brain. Mm. So a newborn baby has very little things to, to for pattern recognition or for identifying or recognising shapes. So it develops that in the early days. That's why they learn so quick. But we, through our growing up, as we mature as human beings, as we grow, we have experiences that keep getting put in our brain, whether we're conscious of them or not, we're, they're all going in there. And when we're looking around and looking at a new environment, new landscape, often when we travel somewhere to, for the first time, we get inspired because we see things that we haven't seen before. But that art of seeing, if you like, is based on recognising certain shapes and patterns and things that, that resonate for us. And they say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And I think that's a lot of what I'm talking about, not just yeah. beauty, but recognizing symbols that mean something to us but may, may not mean something to other people yeah. obviously mm. a lot of the people who do know of my work would be familiar with my aerial work and the aerial art that i try to produce and a lot of that is based around recognizing shapes and symbols and patterns that are iconic that have got archetypal references the, yep. a cross is a cross a tree is a tree and people go up and, and just about anyone who goes up on the plane will see those shapes and go, oh, look, there it is. Yeah, yeah. And then we use that as a platform to tell stories or to insinuate stories about something else, get people thinking of other things. When they're looking yeah. at one thing, they're thinking of something else. And then if you bring into play the value of colour harmonies, how colors affect emotion and when you start looking into that like what red does to people what blue does to people yep. and simplistic terms we say blues calm people down reds are fiery and passionate and energetic yeah, so when you start in, yeah. yeah all of that comes into it so when yeah. you start adding that into your photography or at least consciously adding it into your photography so a lot of my work is simple if you look at it and break it down it's got simple compositions central compositions are quite common with my work Mm. Uh, square, minimal colours. And there's not 44,000 colours in it. It might have two or three main colours. Sure. All of these things are deliberate. Not so much as that I go out to create them, but I recognise them when I see them. Mm. So mm. I think the aerial process or the aerial photography experience is one where, and particularly out of planes and helicopters or hot air balloons versus drones, you're up there, you can see it all in front of you and you can select the areas that you think, wow, that caught my attention. Yeah. What is it about that caught my attention? 
Can I put a frame around it? Can I express it in a way that other people start to understand what it was that I resonated with, what it was that it made me think of, and so on. So that's why I think the parallels, and I'm not saying I've got the talent of an Matisse or a Monet, but the parallels in terms of looking at that work and going, I know what I'm looking at, even though it doesn't look precisely and realistically like that, yeah. But it makes me think of this and it makes me feel this way and I enjoy that. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. When you're talking about, in particular, aerial photography, that pattern recognition and, as you said, code breaking for me certainly comes into it. I know I've had a, a fairly lengthy career at Qantas, not as a yeah. pilot, but <laughs> talking to a lot of people that flew and uh, pilots and uh, flight engineers and so forth it's interesting that one of the examinations for becoming a pilot is pattern recognition because if you're doing visual reference flying then you need to recognize those patterns on the ground to help you navigate and so a key part of that aerial experience i think and for for the passengers as well when they're flying through the air I, I, I know I love to do it. I, I sit in a sit window seat whenever I can and I'm always looking, oh, yeah, I know where I am because that's Dubbo or that's Brisbane yeah. or whatever as I'm flying over them. And you you do that through that pattern re- recognition. So I think that's definitely really an Im- important part of how people see the world and perceive that emotion and the emotional attachment to some of those things that they recognise. So I think you, you're right on the money with that. Yeah, look, most things in, when you talk about music and music, art, photography, poetry, even just narratives, it's all about communication. It's all about expressing something or sharing something so that another party or another group of people can receive some information or receive and that information can be in the form of factual it could be in the form of an emotional type content feeling and understanding the language of of what of understanding the language of the communication medium we're using is is really a powerful tool understanding what color does understanding what contrast Mm -hmm. does understanding what um sharpness or hue or softness does what does that do to the emotion how does that change the way the person interprets what they're looking at. If you think of a bride and you say a bride on her day being soft and angelic, etc., then you're not thinking of high contrast, heavy blacks. You're thinking of high key, lightweight. Um, yep. Similar, if you think of a, you say the most beautiful sunsets, we don't think of heavy clouds. We think of bright vibrant pinks and yellows and oranges or we think of soft oranges and yellows and muted tones but there's something about the colors there's something about the actual physical uh, element of the picture is it sharp and contrasting and lots of heavy lines because i think of if someone wants me to think of a dreamy sunset i don't want to see too many heavy lines like sharp buildings and things i want to see soft curved lines i remember yeah years ago talking to a plastic surgeon who did things like a little, some of the little things they did would be cutting out skin cancers. Yep. And he said, even though that the, the area might need just a straight cut, when they do it, they cut in a curve or an S shape. Because he said, when people look at a straight line on a face, even if it's quite small, they recognize it's that as being not natural. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah, it's incongruous. So they, they basically straight away go, oh, I can see the scar. But if it's got a bit of a curve like nature, like a wrinkle or something, mm. we don't notice it because our brain filters it out. It's, it's said that our brain inter- can take in, it takes in a couple of million to a, to a billion pieces of information every second. I know that sounds incomprehensible, but it, we're taking in information so much. But okay. we can only consciously comprehend seven pieces of information, give or take a two. Mm. That's what they say. So... At any one moment in time where we can only be actually consciously thinking about certain things. So our brain's filtering stuff out. So in the case of the scar, the brain goes, that's natural, doesn't even notice it. But if it was a sharp line, even if it's only a centimetre, we see the scar. Mm. So taking that principle into our photography, whether it's aerial based or whether we're looking at a portrait of a family, 
if there are things in the photograph that are distracting, albeit they be small, then they are going to contribute to the experience of the viewer. And yeah. it's incumbent upon us as the creator of the image to decide do we want that distraction in there or not. Yeah. People talk about real pictures of places and take a landscape photo and there's a bin. You've been there three times and the third time you go to this location, they put in a bin or a sign and you take it out. And someone yeah. says, oh, that's not real. It's, it's not real, but my experience of this place, there's no sign in it. It's not what I go yeah. there for. It's not what I see. Yeah, so, well, it's not what I'm looking at. I'm looking no. past the sign. Yeah. yeah, and I want you to see the reason I came here, and I didn't come here to photograph the sign or the bin. Right. Yeah. But if we're talking about documenting a place for the purpose of a narrative around, hey, look how we stuff up beautiful places by putting bins and signs in, or we're promoting the fact that we should be using bins to get rid of the rubbish, then, yeah, you want it in there as a record. So I yeah. think the purpose and intent of the of the capture has got a lot to do with it. And I think the integrity of the photographer or the creator to let us know what you're looking at is factual or what you're looking at is my experience and my expression of what I saw. That's yeah. the important yeah. thing. Fantastic. You mentioned communications. Mm. How much of your success do you attribute to your ability to communicate well? I think just about all of it, to be honest. I have a background in neurolinguistic programming, which is around the way, way we interpret our world, if you like, keeping it simple. Mm -hmm. And being a like a public speaker since 1990s in, in everything from communication to rapport skills. And for 10 years, I used to train rapport skills to bank boards and nursing federations and rangers and, and accounting firms and things like that. I used to go in there and do training programs yep. around that because people get upset when they show say something to somebody and that person doesn't understand. And the fact is, and unless we take responsibility for the interpretation of what we say, we give up the power. Yeah. What I mean by that is a, a terminology I learned through one of the instructors that I studied under was that the meaning of our communication is the response that we get. If we show if we say something to somebody and they respond in a way that we don't expect, it's because what they took away from what we said isn't what we meant. And that's on yeah. us. Yeah. If we blame them and you say, oh, you idiot, that's not what I meant. Yeah, you you misinterpreted you know? me instead of... Well, then you're giving away the power. You, you've yeah. got to hold on and say, well, hang on, what do I have to say for you to understand what I want you to understand? Yeah. Now, if we bring that to photography, if we show someone, people put a picture in an award and they get upset that the judges don't get it, the judges are responding to what they say. And yeah. if they don't get it and you blame the judges, then you've just basically cut off the only way you can grow. The way you can grow is to listen to the feedback, listen to the commentary, say to yourself, okay, I know what I meant. I know what I intended for people to take away, but they didn't. Yeah. So what do I have to do to, to contribute to that takeaway being yeah. what I want it to be? So communication is everything. Um, having said that, as, as a photographic artist or an artist of any type, you've also got the right to say, this is what I want to do. And I don't care if anybody gets it. That's fine too. <laughs> It's when yeah. we go into the commercial world or we go into the world of, of, of an award or the world of um, people buying our work, exhibiting. If people don't buy our work, it's not because they have a problem. It's because they just don't respond to it. That's it. And we can leave it there. Or we can say, I need people to buy my work so I can feed my kids mm. or feed myself. So what? how do I do that? And that's that dilemma that artists find themselves in. How do I get a return from what I'm doing. So we find many photographers and artists these days and they're living one way and then get the freedom to express another way where yeah. it doesn't matter. So there's probably less full-time photographers or people in the photography industry who earn their living from their photography. Than yeah, their the creative to. photography as opposed yeah. to the... the well, even, I, even, I, I, I have this sort of mental split in my mind. There's commercial stuff and then yeah. there's creative stuff. And yeah. okay, if you're lucky, some of the creative stuff will sell, but the commercial realm is where the money is made. And that's yeah. really where I put most of the focus from a business perspective is into, okay, how am I progressing there and how am I getting new clients and how am I keeping clients that I've already got happy? Yeah. I, I One of the greatest satisfactions I get these days is the fact that for the last probably 10 years or more, 
I don't enter awards a lot because I'm 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 often involved in them, and I yeah. it's better. You know, sometimes I can't, or I just choose not to. But when I'm not involved, sometimes I'll enter it just maybe just to say to the people that I coach and mentor, hey, I can still do it. Like yeah, I'm yeah. still getting. But <laughs> but the thing I I get the most satisfaction from is the images that I'm putting into those awards are the very same images that I'm exhibiting as one and two meter pieces in galleries that mm. are selling and going up on walls in private residences, in hotels, in places like that. So yeah. what I'm trying to produce is art that I love, my work, and it goes out there, it's selling and it's getting recognised in my industry when peers look at it and say, yeah, okay, that's worth a pretty high mark. Yeah. So that's a level of satisfaction that I've achieved that I feel pretty blessed. And it, it you talked about inspiration earlier. It does inspire me what I'm looking for. It motivates me to keep trying to produce the work that can do that. So it's commercial, but it's also getting recognition in other ways. Yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit about that inspiration and how you stay motivated to experiment and try new ideas and new techniques. Is that something that's really important to you or trying to focus on stuff that you know and tried and tested techniques that you've uh, used before? Yeah, look, I think it's really important that the first thing I say is that I don't know of anyone who can stay inspired and motivated all the time. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, it's impossible. Yeah. We meet people that look like that, like they're always upbeat. They're, but my experience of working with people and as human beings is that mm. nobody stays at that level all the time. So for the listeners out there or the viewers, if they get a chance to see this video, um, thinking I must be something wrong or whatever because I feel like I haven't got it today or this week or this month. I get that. Yeah. I get that 100%. I understand that. I can tell you without mentioning names, some of the best photographers in the country that are friends of mine get that. Mm. We all have that. And I think it's that rise and fall that's really important to understand that if you try to stay at the top, the pressure that comes from being motivated all the time becomes a debilitating experience in itself so it actually yeah. put you're under pressure and some of our best work and most creative work happens when we almost don't care when we just let go yeah in a more practical way when i did weddings from you know from very early on to right through to when i stopped i had a 10 percent rule and i used to tell my clients i said 90 percent of what i shoot is going to be what you expect this is what yeah. i do this is why you've booked me but 10 percent of the day 10% mixed through that day, I'm going to try things that may or may not work. I'm yeah. not happy to show you what they are. And you might look at them and think, what was he thinking? That's terrible. That's crap. Yeah. But that's how I keep getting better. But that's how I'll produce something individual for you. And they love that yeah. because they become part of a creative process. And creativity by definition is producing something that didn't exist before. So if it hasn't been around before, we haven't seen it before, then or it's pretty hard to produce something completely unique. But we haven't seen it in that form before, then mm. we don't know what the response will be. So I enjoy watching. Part of what motivates me is trying things and seeing how people will respond to it. Will it get a will it get a response? Will it attract? Will it resonate? Yeah. I also sounds creepy. I'm a people watcher. I like <laughs> it's, it's strange because I remember being on a panel with a group of people. It was actually for a I think it was a, a like a more female type of uh, conference, but I was one of the speakers to talk about portraiture. And the question was asked to the panel who were introverts and who were extroverts. Yeah. And interestingly enough, most of the audience thought that we would all be extroverts because we get on stage and speak. But the reality yeah. was five of five out of the six of us were introverts. Mm. And I quite like sitting back and observing and just watching things as they interact in the world, and then something will jump out at me as being interesting. And I think in terms of being motivated, we can look for external motivation. But one of the areas that I'd encourage people to explore is to give more value to what interests us, to find, to, to trust your curiosity and go. Yeah. They talk about going back to being a child. I think children are one of the greatest examples of staying motivated because they remain curious. And the more curious you are, the longer you'll find yourself or the more often you'll find yourself motivated and inspired because it's curiosity that invites us to explore new things. 
Yeah. It's curiosity yeah. that ex- invites us to find out more about ourselves, more about how our skills and our and our and our knowledge can be applied to different things. And I, a lot of my early magazine advertising for weddings was inspired and drawn from surfing magazines, not wedding magazines. Yep. I would look at other things and see how I could apply them. So if you talk about these books like I think it's Paolo Coelho called The Alchemist. And yep. when we talk about alchemy, where we take two things and put them together in a way that hasn't been put to, they haven't been put together before to create something new. Yeah. I love that process. I love seeing how that works and I love applying that to everything I do in life. Right? Yeah. Even to the point of going home a different way, which might you know, you know, bugs my wife or whoever's in the car, because they'll say, that's the long way. By me, it is by 33 seconds, but it's different. It's got yeah. to stimulate me. Traveling different ways just for the sake of it inspires and motivates me because I see new things coming across my vision. Yeah. Yeah. We talk about video and stills, and one of the reasons video is so much more dominant in social media is that we're seeing so many frames per second, and our brain, when nothing changes in front of us, it switches off. Yeah. In terms of being inspired, if we continuously put new things in front of us as a process, our brain has to interpret it because as human beings, our brain is a meaning-making machine. Our brain cannot try to make sense of the world. It just can't. Yeah. Yeah. So if it stays in the same place, seeing the same things, it can get lazy. It just yeah. doesn't need to make sense of it because it's been looking at it over and over and knows what to expect. Mm. But if we forcibly give it new things to interpret, even if it's just walking to the shops in a different way, um, then we force it to start going back, getting back into gear and start trying to make sense of the world. And it's when we make sense of the world, we find things. And I think that's the process that inspires me. When we look at other people's work or we listen to other people, other people talk about their work and what inspires them, we start to see things differently. We see through other people's eyes. So one of the things I love talking about in keynotes is a shift in perspective. I think I've got a talk that I've given quite a few times, which is basically titled, a shift in perspective brings new understandings. And that's a little bit about being motivated, that when we move from where we see the world to a new place, we have to reinterpret everything again, and that gets exciting. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned the uh, the stuff going across your vision changing, and to me that harks back to that primitive brain that we all have, the amygdala in the <laughs> middle of the brain, that... Uh, sits there interpreting, looking for threats. And the way it does that is through that visual cortex saying something's changed. Do I need to pay attention to it? Is it a threat? Is it not? If it's not, it's okay. You can still gain pleasure out of those those changes. But it's it's that primitive brain that's sitting there saying, hello, something's different. (laughs) I need to pay attention. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. In, in, you know, is is drawn from the word motor, moving, yeah. motor movement, and exactly where the if you break it right down, the human being is either stimulated by flight or fight, yep. and also there's the carrot and the stick principle that we either go towards something that attracts us, we move away from something that we fear. Yeah. So as the world changes, as something's changing, we have to interpret it. Our brain cannot stop itself, but look at it as a basic mechanism and say, that's interesting, I'm attracted to it, or that's mm. scary, or I'm not sure, I've got, it's got warning signs, I'll move away from it. Yeah. And then we start interpreting and moving. And yeah, the brain is problem solving continuously. Absolutely. And if we give it problems to solve, of course. Mm. Mm. One of the other things you touched on was the difficulty of finding something unique. Is there anything unique in landscape photography, in your opinion? A very close friend of mine, Peter Eastway, will tell you that nothing's, not, there is nothing unique. And I think he quotes Susan Sontag and some of yeah. her, her writings about that. And it's an interesting debate because I, maybe it's romantic in me, Grant. I, for me, I believe there are things out there that are unique mm-hmm. because I can't, I don't want to entertain the possibility that it's all been done. Now, yeah. Yeah. is that being uh, blinkered? No, I don't think so. I think. If you go back into, if you want to study quantum physics and and look into that area, the the observer changes things. When we look at something, 
it's real, but it's only real for that observer in that moment in time. And it's slightly different real for somebody else. Mm. I think there are lots of unique ways of seeing different things. I've seen the same thing. And I think there's lots of different things that can be expressed in the same way. So often when we say, okay, this is how I would shoot a still life of a mechanical part of a car. What if I use that to exact style on a living thing, like a macro of an insect or something? Yeah. And there's I see things that come out and are they in general terms unique? No, but when you look at it, you think well, that's a unique way of presenting it and that's a unique way of showing it. Mm. So there's a part of me that fights back with the argument that if I move, if I go to a beach that's been photographed a thousand times, there will be a place on that beach that I can photograph it from that no one stood on, yeah. even though it's been done a thousand times. So technically speaking, it's unique. Mm. Even though the content that I'm looking at has been there and everyone's photographed it, it's the way I'm sharing it and presenting it. Yeah. Then when I go into the post-production process, there are a million different things I can do. Mm. There are different ways, how much contrast, how little contrast, the saturation, the hue, the color balance, the sharpness, the crop, all of these things can change it. If we think of the photograph as a unique item in itself, not just what the photograph is of, but the photograph yep. itself is an item in the world, the physical print, it's unique in its own way. Yeah. We can have people show us pictures of something, and there's in Australia we have things like Sugarloaf Rock in in Southwest WA, you've got the 12 Apostles, you've got Uluru, you've got the, the Harbour Bridge, the Barrier Reef. We see these things and we see them come across our social media platforms or, or whatever, and we think, oh, I've seen that a thousand times. Yeah. yeah. But often one comes across and we go, oh, I like that. Yeah. And it's because somebody's found a way to present it that we haven't seen before. So I think therein lies the secret of being unique. And then the other thing I bring into the argument is that as as interesting or as strange as it sounds, nobody in the there's never been a Grant Swinburne in the past, now or in the future, precisely like you. Yep. And yep. each of us is unique in the universe. And I know I'm not trying to be religious and spiritual, but no, I, I know fact, where you're from. That is a fact. If we talk about billions of processes going on that make up just who I am, and then there are seven or eight billion people in the world, mm. the permutations are just um, uncomprehensible. We can't. So there's always something unique to do. And I know my mate Pete Eastway will say, yeah, when you look at it, they look the same. No, <laughs> there's a slight difference. So, yeah. yes, I believe there is. And I am I think that's one of the motivations I have is pursuing ways of showing things that are different. We, one of the most commonly photographed aerial places in the world these days is Shark Bay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's fascinating to watch people go there for the first time and discover a place that I might have photographed a hundred times and I know a lot of people have photographed and they're excited. And, and mm. I think that's fantastic because Absolutely. they've found something new in their world. And then when we share it to the wider audience, we start to discover, okay, maybe it's not that unique, but it will always remain unique because no one was in that particular part of the air on yeah. that particular day with that particular tide and that particular angle of light and that particular wave mechanism happening and that yep. particular, yep. it'll be unique. Yeah. Be unique. Brilliant. <laughs> I like I like that concept. <laughs> Where do you see things like cultural and social perspectives fitting into how we include more people in the landscape photography fraternity? I think one of the, we're a couple of middle-aged white males ha having a chat now and there's a lot yeah. of them out there with cameras doing, I won't say, like you said, they're doing their own unique thing. How do we foster that uh, diversity and inclusion in, in the field of landscape photography? I think I know where you're heading. Yeah, look, it's a really interesting question because the, the same principle or discussion comes up when you talk about, for instance, in, in putting judging panels together for a competition. Absolutely. And yeah. I remember when I was chairman of the Australian Photography Awards with the AIPP and mm. we would often get letters saying, and in the one letter, we would get quite adamant pe people saying, this is what should happen. 
you need diversity on your judging panels for, let's say, landscape, whatever. Yep, yep. We need gender mix and we need cultural mix. And I, a standalone comment, 100% agree. Then in the same letter, the same person would say, and you need the best people in this genre judging these competitions. Yeah. And standalone context, I agree, 100%. Then they would say, and in order to give the competition value, these you need the best people in this genre entering the competition. And then the fourth pillar of their sort of push would be, and it's important that people who judge these competitions don't enter them because of a conflict of interest. Yeah. And when you put those four things together, they're mutually exclusive. exclusive. Yeah. They're incompatible. Yeah. So, and I, you know, the other flip of the coin is we had one year we introduced the birth category to the competition and we wanted to listen to the general push, which was diversity. So we needed a male or we needed some male on the panel. Yep. And I was the only one that really had photographed a birth in our pool of judges at the time. Sure. So I'd done a few births. So I was on the panel and they had a few complaints because some of the people watching the judging said, what's, what's in birth? What's he got to do with it? So it's a very it's a very interesting conversation. Yeah. When it comes to actually people doing it, I think we're seeing it, Grant. I've I'm very lucky. I, I one of the things I do a lot of is coaching and mentoring, as you're probably aware. And sure, sure. three quarters of the people I coach and mentor are female. Yeah. And while they're not so many of the younger ones, I think the younger ones are coming through. We see it in social media. Yeah. That whole, the influencers who in the early days maybe were quite snapshot artists, but they're becoming very good photographers, a lot of them. Yeah. And so we're seeing a better quality of work coming through from a younger de de demographic, from a mixed gender, whatever the gender they identify with is almost irrelevant to me in this, in what we do. It's It's got mm. nothing to do with it. So that's yep. not really relevant. But in terms of, it's a catch-22. We used to get an argument within the AIPP where people would say, the AIPP is made up of all these middle-aged white guys with beards. But the reality was three-quarters of the membership were female and yeah. the half or two-thirds of the board was female and the president was female. And so I think there's a carryover mentality which doesn't necessarily match the reality. Yeah, the perception and, and my, doesn't always match what... No, what, and I no, think... No. Yeah. People are commenting on things without actually looking into it because yeah. I, I may be naive. I hope not, but I do see way more. I, go, I talk at camera clubs, I do a lot in the camera clubs and things like that, and there is a lot of female influence coming through. And I got to mm. say, the it's interesting because this is being this is profiling at the wor at the worst. But often in a camera club, you'll find the men are more historically, particularly the older guys tend to have a focus on the equipment and gear yep. and the ladies come in and they have more of a focus on the aesthetic and the creativity. Yeah. But what's really nice is the respect is starting to go across and we're seeing that influence of the female side coming through in the male side and all of us, male, female or other, we all have a female and a male side to us. Yeah. And if you want to go down that road of philosophy, it's the masculine side of us that determines the problem solving of how to do it. And it's the feminine side of us that determines why and, and what it is we want to do. Mm -hmm. So creativity relies on both a feminine and a masculine input in order to be successful. I quite happily, I've got daughters and I love the way they see the world. Yep. Uh, I love watching how a lady using her femininity approaches landscape the softness of it the esoteric mm. of it the aesthetics of it but i also enjoy sitting down with the white gray bearded group who the guys the older guys who've been caught up in the gear game for 30 years because if you've got a problem to solve when it comes to gear they're the guys with the answers yeah so yeah. not saying that i haven't met ladies who are technically fantastic because i'm not a technical guru you know i go to the peter eastways and and people like that for me but there are ladies I've met who are technically way ahead of me. Yeah, um, yeah. But I've also met ladies who are caught up in that technical side. And when they struggle to produce, <coughs> excuse me, work that's creative and inspiring, it's because they haven't tapped into that 
soft esoteric side. So I think it's a blend yeah. of it's a blend of it all, and it needs to come through all of us as well as it is to be seen in the environment. But I think it's coming, and I think it's if you look out there, you'll see it. I do. One of the other things, it's I guess it's slightly less of an issue from a, an aerial photography perspective, but one of the other things that I've seen in the industry and with landscape photographers in particular is thinking about some of the ethical considerations with Indigenous sacred lands and how people approach those subjects and how people can actually approach them with respect and sensitivity. Have you got anything to say on that regard? Yeah, I think you talked to me earlier. We are, we talked about communication and the value of it. And I think mm. the two words I would say when we start talking about these areas are communication and respect. Yep. I, I think they have to be at the forefront of what you do. Um, a guy I, I've worked alongside of, very talented photographic artist, mixed media artist, a guy called Clayton Hares, really interesting guy, South African descent, and he has done some work in the area of Indigenous locations to, to explore his work and what he does. But he'll always, he goes in and he'll talk to the people involved, he'll talk to the elders, he'll talk to the group that's responsible for that land, and he'll explain what he's doing and why and look for permissions. And I think it's about respect and it's about communication and trying to understand. The funny thing is, Grant, if you do that, you're a long way down the track towards producing a far better expression of whatever it is you're trying to shoot anyway. Absolutely. Because the more we understand about what it is we're photographing, the better chance we've got of expressing those hidden elements and those layers of meaning Mm. that we probably want to capture in the first place. Yeah, Otherwise, yeah. We're, we're a bit ignorant. Saying that, there are people who want to go in without having any of that bias. I get that as well. And perhaps that can be part of the conversation. I'd like to photograph this. I respect but don't want to be biased by those stories. That's fine yeah, too. Yeah. It's just, be, be, I think, transparency, communication, and uh, uh, underneath all of that, in all things, respect. Just respect the people, even if you don't, even if you don't understand or value what they what their belief is, yep. I think you still should respect that they have the right to have those beliefs in the same way that each of us want people to respect the way we want things done or what we think is important. Yeah, if yeah. we want that, it has to be reciprocal. Communication Definitely. and respect. Definitely. I want to move on to some of the business side of things uh mm -hmm. you do quite a lot of workshops mm -hmm. how did you get started in that was it just a, a a way of helping pay the bills or was it something more motivational about sharing knowledge and uh, and so forth i strangely enough i think it's always been me i'm the oldest child of an oldest child i grew up i was born in malaysia mm -hmm. and I went to six different schools in the first seven years of school. So uh, what I'm trying to say is I had a foundation that was instinctive or inherent in me from early years of having to connect and build rapport and learn to um, adapt. Yep. And consequently, as an oldest child and, and, and with those background, that background, I found myself in sporting teams. I would be the captain or the coach or both. If I, as a young adult, I would be involved in boards, I'd get onto committees and I'd always end up as managing the committee or something like that. So leadership roles were something that was quite inherently inherent to me. Yep. And being the oldest child and the oldest grandchild with a big family, I was always in charge of or responsible for or empowered to pass on to other people. So it was just part of who I am. And then back in, Gosh, 1995, the, the Australian Professional Awards and the New Zealand Professional Awards systems had a process where after their awards, they would select the top 20 images from each country, put them in a competition, which was judged, and there would be points given and one country would win what was effectively a photography Anzac truck cup. It was called the, yep. the Trans-Tasman Cup. And there was the Trans-Tasman Trophy, which went to the high scoring print of okay. that little competition and sure. in 1995 i won that competition 
And winning that competition got me a trip to the other country, which for me would be New Zealand, to go to their conference the following year and to be a speaker. Mm. And I went over and spoke. And up until that point, I'd done some other training. I used to teach, as I said, communication and rapport and things like that. And I went and spoke and they invited me back. Um, word of mouth, people said, oh, that was really good. Can you come and talk here? And so things started. So I started doing a lot of talking way back then. Yeah. And yeah. then that became people approaching me saying, do you do any one-on-one coaching and things like that? And it basically evolved to these day, to this day where it started taking up so much of my time. And I probably spend, I would say, 30 to 40% of my time mentoring, coaching, Not all pay. The camera clubs is more of a pro bono thing for most of us. Um, Some of the areas that I go to, conferences, they're not paying you. They might cover your costs, but you're giving back. And I I am where I am because of the people that shared their knowledge with me Mm. through the years. And as a result, I think it's it's a responsibility for me to be giving that back. And I've tried to do that for a long time. But at the same time, I've got to the point where it becomes... Part of what I do as I get older is sharing that knowledge in a more professional way. Yep. So I have a, a mastermind group, which I run every year, and that's now in its sixth year. It's only six people. And uh, there's a waiting list for it, which is great. It's not a big waiting list. Usually there's one or two halfway through the year for next year. Sure. And then when people drop off because they have the choice to stay on it, then new people can come in. But I also have one-on-one mentoring with people from Europe, America, Africa, and Australia, of course, which will be yeah. anything from a couple of sessions to a nine-month program. And it's not about teaching Photoshop and it's not about teaching lighting and posing. That will come into our conversations. But it's more about helping to uncover what it is that people love about photography, what it is they're trying to get out of it. Yeah. It's about fostering confidence, helping them find their lane, Mm-hmm. What did, what they want out of photography? For a lot of the people I work with, they're prosumers at best. So they're not looking to this to be putting bread on the table. Yeah, It's an outlet. It's there. And they've invested 10, 20, 30, maybe as much as 100 grand in camera gear or more. Yeah. To invest in a bit of education is, is something they want to do. So then you've got the conferences. And I've done a lot of conferences over the year and hosted many of them for a long time now, since early, since the 1990s I, I hosted conferences and I love being involved in a process that brings people together for community for networking for sharing that involves professionals or experts or people with experience being on stage and sharing the knowledge that involves people processing that and discovering that there's another step they can take and then helping coordinate all that bring it all together yep. yeah yeah it's just been an evolution, I think, of, but it's been, I hinted earlier that for me, my art is about mathematics, poetry, music, and visuals all coming together. That's what my photography is about. Yeah. In this, and and that is that is an expression of who I am as a person and have always been. I was mm. very good at maths and science at school, physics. But the same with speaking. I think it becomes an evolution that you're doing this because it's something you, that's part of who you are. You Definitely. bring it, you're connecting people at, from a part of the industry to others who are interested in that part of the industry yeah. and you're bringing them together. So that's just who I am. I'll keep doing it as long as people want me to keep teaching and sharing. And, and I love poking. I love giving people a conundrum. Like on stage, there's nothing I love more than to throw a question to the audience that I know they can't answer instantly. That's yeah. going to force them to rethink rethink the norm rethink the way they're looking at their photography and go away and often say to people my goal in this hour and a half or this half day workshop is to pick you up turn you upside down shake the crap out of you put you back on your feet and send you out the door in a way that's going to sorry about that in a way that's going to get you to rethink what you're doing and maybe find a way to do it differently and and maybe even better fantastic What's one of the most important things to remember in terms of promoting your personal brand for somebody that's just starting out in the industry and and trying to build a business out of this? I think consistency Mm -hmm. uh, is important. 
if we jump around all over the place, people don't know what we represent or what we do. I think stand behind it. This is what I do. And I said earlier about awards and, and exhibitions, and if people don't buy it, then it's up to you. Um, yeah. A lot of artists start off and spend many years where people don't really like their work and people, oh, you're ahead of your time or whatever. I think it's about being consistent so people get used to the fact that that's what you do and they start to fall in love with it or they start to understand it or it stands out as being different because it's consistent. Yeah. Um, the consistency of message. And the other thing I think is important that, and I learned this through the business earlier with Portrait Weddings, you are your business. In our world, in our industry, you are your business. Um, Absolutely. How you present all the time. So you can't be nice to a client that comes to your business or comes to your exhibition during the exhibition time when you're on the job and you know, you're dressed up, you're, you're looking trendy or whatever it is your thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then they see you down the beach of the shop and you're rude and you're dismissive. It's just yeah. part of it. You, They say with sports people, particularly sports people, you know, they get paid a lot of money, but there's responsibility with that. When they're in the street, if a little kid comes up to an AFL footballer and he's rude, I think, I think that's where we have a problem because, yeah. you know, you're, you're always going to be your brand. And particularly as an image maker, I think that's important. So I'd like to think that when people come across me in – outside of a conference or an exhibition or on the job and they bump into me somewhere that I'm as approachable and I'm the same person that they can hear and see today. Mm. If I'm in a, overseas and I, me I remembered being in Spain on a family holiday and of course I had my camera and I was photographing in a river in the south of Spain, you know, the bridge and I forget the name of it. It's the big bridge with the arches that features in one of the James Bond movies yeah. where yep. Daniel Craig jumps off the train so I'm in this river and there's a cafe and everything and I'm standing in the middle of the river and I'm about 100 metres from the cafe and all these tourists and out of the blue I hear this, Tony Hewitt! <laughs> and I turn around and I think, what? And this guy comes and he says, Tony Hewitt! He says, you were speaking at our camera club about six months ago. You won't remember me. <laughs> and we had a chat and that and he says, oh, he said, it was so good to see you there. And I remembered someone said to me later when I was at another camera club, yeah. he said, I was talking to somebody and they said they saw you in, in Spain and they said, and you were just the same as you were when they came, when you came to the camera club. <laughs> and, and I think when we talk about our brand, that's part of it. Yeah. yeah I, clothing, what you speak, what you wear, all of that. Yeah, look, if you talk to someone who's in brand management, they'll say that everything you do is going to contribute to it. And I think that's important. You don't have to go overboard who I am and I think the other thing is don't fall into the trap of trying to be something you're not yeah don't try to profess to be an expert in areas that you're not I often get people in in coaching or even when I'm on stage or whatever will ask questions technically and I reach my limit and I say look no I don't have the answer for that and there'll be yeah. even I've even been in quite not they used to be uncomfortable now more humorous where people would suddenly take pride in being able to tell the audience what I don't know. And I think my answer I've learned over the years is that if you like what I do and if you've stood in front of my pictures and you think they're great yep. and you don't have to, but if you do, then I got there with what I know. What I didn't know didn't matter because I got there with what I know and here's what I know. Yeah. And right. there are other ways to get there and I can help you find those people if you want to know. If it comes to colour management at the highest level, I'm not the colour management guru. I know enough to do what I do. Yeah. But I'll send you to the Les Walkling, the Dr. Les Walklings or the Ian Vanderwalds or the Rocco Ancoras and people like that. Mm. If you want to know all about different camera systems and camera gear, I'm not the guy. But yeah. I know a little bit. Here's what I know. And if you need more, here's who to go to. Go and look at a Peter Eastway. Go and look at a landscape photography world podcast where you've probably had a guest on who's yeah. really good at that you yeah know? that's <laughs> what i'll do so don't be any don't try to be something you're not but be proud of what you do know and remember if people have come to you because of something they admire about what you do then you did it with what you already know that's it be proud of that yeah awesome great advice one of the things i like to ask the photographers i talk to is where that nexus between place, technique, and subject sort of crossover, and 
have you found that where you live has influenced how and what you shoot worldwide when you take that overseas? Or do you find the technique or the the way that you take the photos is the, 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 the primary thing that's driving the way that you shoot or how you shoot? Yeah, I think over the rightly or wrongly over the years, I've, I've started to understand that if I get too concerned with how important the technique is, I go off track because it's not, I'm not about technique. Yep. What's behind my image making is relevant, whether I'm in a plane over Shark Bay or looking at a red desert or standing in a mountain range mm -hmm. or looking at snow. Yep. I think for me, it's about trying to create a physical representation or a visual representation in the physical world of my feelings about what I'm going through when I'm in a new, when I'm in an environment. Yep. My wife loves to go down to the beach and sunset. Yep. And there are some times when she says, oh, we should go down tonight, it'll be good. And I I must admit, I've, I'm a little demotivated. I'm not as motivated because the sunset itself doesn't inspire me. But if I go with her, and often we do because she's, she's so enthusiastic about it, and she'll be down there taking pictures and I get inspired, And but my process will cut in, my process, not the process of photographing a sunset, sure. but my yeah. exploration of things. Does where I live in... Look, I think it does to a degree because I live in Western Australia. For those overseas who don't know Perth, it's the most isolated capital city in the world. The climate yep. is very much Mediterranean, Californian, if you like, for the Europe and North American people. Temperate climate, we've got no snow in this country. I think about once every four years we get half an inch of snow on a one mountain, which is five hours from Perth, which is a mountain that is only about 4,000 feet high, so it's not really a mountain. And people big, drive their kids all through the night just to show them the bit of snow. So when I go to somewhere like Middlehurst Station in New Zealand, where we run our retreats yeah. every year, that is in winter and we'll get three feet of snow overnight and things like that, mm. or go to Iceland or, or North America and travel through some of the, the parks and, and things. Yeah, there's a uniqueness. There's something different. And I think that's for all of us. And that's one way to force inspiration is just to go somewhere you've never been before. Travel. Just travel yeah. for travel's sake to see something different. And does where I live in, influence that? I think it has to because this is what we normally are used to and this is different. Yeah. Interestingly, the more you go somewhere, so the inspirations I get from Middlehurst because we've run that retreat now for seven years in a row or North America where I've been many times that inspiration shifts because now it's becoming a little more like my backyard. Yeah. Right. And so I'm not getting that impact of this is entirely different. Wow. And the first time I saw snow in England was pull over in the car because it's snowing, jump out and throw snowballs because you can, even though I was an adult. These days you just, it's slushy and you've got to get there safely. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I think it does. But I think the fact that we're, if we, as I said, I can still force myself to go to the shop in a different way. Yeah. I can take a different way home, even if Google Maps tells me it's going to take three and a half minutes longer. Yeah. Really? Am I, that's that three and a half minutes invested in seeing something I wouldn't have saw, seen versus an extra three and a half minutes at home watching a movie or yeah. Yeah. sitting at home. Use your time. Think about it. Maybe yeah. that little longer trip is just the way to do it. Yeah, yeah. No. I don't know if I answered the question. I've got off. Yeah, no, no, no. Was, you, you certainly did in my mind. <laughs> yeah. I, I hope I asked it in a way that you understood it. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, I think I know where you were coming from. Yeah. Travel in itself, and just we touched on it several times before that we we don't we have always got control over what's happening every minute. I know people say. So I know I have it on at work or whatever. Yeah, but you could choose to go to work by riding your bike instead of. Exactly. You know, I, I had a, a, a guy that was in one of our groups and one of our mastermind programs, and he, and he was looking for a project because part of what I do is encourage projects. And he didn't have time. He said, I don't have time. I said, how do you get how, what, Tell me about your day. He says, I ride to work. And I said, riding to work, take your camera, take a small camera, or use your phone. And mm -hmm. when you're riding to work, 
make a point of on the way to work and on the way home, take one picture. Or on the way to work, look at locations and on the way home, take a picture of it. Another gentleman who's a pilot also had a problem, had challenges around time. And I and he said, but sometimes in the plane, in the cockpit, because he's a commercial pilot, not jumbos and that, private things, you know, often you're an autopilot because you're in a four-hour flight, five-hour flight, and you're just sitting there looking around. I said, show me what it looks like from the cockpit. So he created this whole series around what he saw from his cockpit. Yeah. You know? yeah. I think I think we can find things. It doesn't have to be all that glamour. Yeah, it's great to look at social media and Billy Bob's just come back from Greenland and he's off to Iceland and such is going to Patagonia and somebody's in the Atacama Desert and yeah. somebody's just been trekking through Nigeria or maybe not Nigeria these days, but been to Antarctica and we get a bit of FOMO and I do too. I look at it and go, oh, damn, that's one place I haven't been. I'd love to go there. Yeah. But we can still find difference differences close to home. We really Absolutely. can. We can push that. Speaking about worldwide, have you got a favourite place that you uh, keep getting called back to that just says, I've got to be there? Yeah, it's not as far away as people might think. Um, <laughs> I love New Zealand. Sugarloaf Rock. <laughs> I think I've photographed Sugarloaf Rock twice in my life. <laughs> it's the same as the Blue Boat Shed. I've never actually photographed the Blue Boat Shed. Have you not? Uh, okay. No, uh, and I've, I've uh, done it. It's, it's literally 12 <laughs> minutes from me. Yeah, I just and I'm not, I'm not saying you shouldn't. I'm just yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I in the know. same way, if if I go to Sydney, I'm fascinated by the Sydney Harbour Bridge. So I'll take pictures as I'm driving under it, you know. Yeah. But uh, I just love New Zealand. I think I like the fact that it's you can drive and not see many people. It's very it's sparse. It's one of the most beautiful countries I've ever been to, and I haven't been everywhere, but it's certainly one of the most beautiful. It's safe. You're not worried about other things. I think that's part of it. Not that I'm overly worried about traveling to places. Yeah, look, I think there's, I think when you talk about where would you revisit, it's more about places I haven't been that probably, because the idea of going somewhere new is going to stimulate new thoughts and new processes sure, and sure. new ideas. I'm off to Greece. I haven't been to Greece. Okay. And, and I'm going to Greece in September with Nick Melodonis, who's, been in the net landscape game for a long time. Nick's Greek. He's been going there for 20 years and he invited me to come along with him for a year, for which is fantastic to be able to go through Greece on a workshop or like a photo tour yeah, with yeah. with another guy who knows it, who speaks Greek. But that's not going to be very few people in sparse landscapes. That's going to be people and old ruins and things like that, a different yeah. experience. Yeah. But I, I certainly, and I haven't been to... Bolivia and some of the okay. things there. And that yeah. I'm, twice I was set up and COVID was one that got in the way. And a few years back, I couldn't go at the last, we had to change plans. So that's still on my hit list. Mm. But then again, like I said, Peter Eastway and I go to Middlehurst. I'm not trying to plug it, but we go there every ah, year <laughs> and we run a, run a retreat there. And I love going back there because each time I go back there, I discover another layer. Yeah. So I, I think there's two things that attract me. One is new places and one is going to the places that I've enjoyed in the past because I'll go and find a, yeah. a new layer to that place that I didn't see before. And that becomes even more pertinent when you talk about what's close to home. Yeah. When you do travel a bit, you come home and then you become appreciate what's in your backyard more as well. Absolutely. And the other place that I always love going to is Shark Bay. I, I could mm. never tire of flying over the the, the the waters of Shark Bay because it's just so incredibly beautiful yeah. in so many different diverse ways. Fantastic. You've obviously got a lot of memorable experiences over the years. Have you had any horror stories, things that you've gone, gee, that was uh, a shocker? <laughs> I, I shouldn't have gone there or <laughs> um, I wish I'd I mean, I wish look, I'd bought my camera. <laughs> there's look, if I dip into the wedding in experiences, I had a couple of wedding experiences, but that's a whole different type of in terms of landscape and travel, I think oh gosh, I can't actually think of anything that was like incredibly bad. I'm I, we've been Pete and I do often do a America road trips. And we've done a lot of the northwest area, everywhere from San Fran, LA, through through the, all the parks up to um, Yellowstone, all of that, 
and yep. variations. And I know with a couple of times where we've been in blizzards and couldn't travel where we wanted to and had to backtrack and it's three o'clock in the morning and we're having to put snow chains on and it's minus 10. And you're thinking, what am I doing here? But there's a part of you that's going, what am I doing here? This is fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So I can't say they're horror stories. I've been lucky, touch wood, not to smash gear or anything, but I've had people on trips break phase ones, drop them on rocks or into water and no, uninsured. That's an expensive and- drop, yeah. <clears throat> it is when it's not insured and and you know, just watching them for the next week of, it's the second day of a 12 day tour yeah and that that's it's more those things where people are having a bad experience rather than me um, yeah. because i'll i think i'm i don't know I'm, i i'll have a good experience no matter where i am just the fact that the world's different i'm alive you know i woke up above the ground not below it means yep. it's a good day yep. absolutely and, Geez, Grant, why would I complain? My my office is anywhere <laughs> in the world. Sometimes, uh, my my I've never had the same day twice yeah. in my working experience. I get to give people aha moments. I get to take them places that I've seen many times, but they see for the first time. I love watching people's faces when they see the Grand Canyon for the first time, and I don't mean from a distance. It's when they walk to the edge and look into it and go, "Holy!" Like it's, I love that experience. I love watching people in aircraft for the first time when they get up there and the adrenaline's bursting out of them and they're nervous and then they look down and take their first picture and then they come back and sit in the restaurant or sit in wherever we are and look at their pictures on their laptop and suddenly realise that there's a whole world that they can share with others. Um, So horror stories, no. um, Getting scared, yeah. A couple of places, a little nervous. No, I'm sorry, I can't. That's okay. I can't. <laughs> it's great that someone's having a, a great time all the time. <laughs> look, there's, there, I, I suppose there are. Th- th- look, there are people that get on your nerves. We have oh, yeah. in a group of twelve people, there will always be personality clashes. So there's always going to be something when you're traveling with new with people that you. There's all those experiences, but I think that's part of it. Yeah, it's part of definitely. it builds tolerance. I've had experiences where I've shot things and, and I'll be there as the instructor and it's aerial and, you know, Tony's supposed to be pretty good at aerial and I come back and all of my shots are out of focus. I've had that mm-hmm. experience, particularly when this that particular experience was we used to tape our lenses a lot. All um, oh, right, yep. And, and, some, and I'd have people come up to me before we're getting in, can you, take, can you check my lenses? And I'd be checking everybody's gear and then we'd jump in the helicopter and I quickly set mine and t- tape it and if you put it out by one mil... Mm. then it's out. Out, yeah. And on a medium format camera, you don't have a lot of uh, scope. Yeah. And suddenly I come back and everyone's excited and they're looking at theirs and you'll be hearing comments, can't wait to see what Tony got. <laughs> and I'm going through going, holy crap. So you've got to own up. i got nothing. And, and fess up. That, yeah, guys, I blew it. But I, look, even saying that on that occasion and sometimes when I've lost a couple of things, people... You can see their face like, God, it even happens to people like that. Yeah. That's it. Gert by Sea, the project I went around Australia with a colleague, that was, that had a couple of moments which were interesting. So Mm. I think that's part and parcel of what you do, but it's part of what makes you stronger. The problem solving kicks in. Inspiration comes from the opportunity to do something different, I think. And often when we're challenged, that's when we find ways to do things different. Yeah, fantastic. What do you see as being the biggest challenge facing landscape photographers right now? I think the obvious answer would be AI. Mm. Um, There's been a lot of discussions but, on this podcast about AI and different opinions about how it will impact things. I think there's obviously the ethical consideration of somebody posting images on social media and pretending they're photography when they're not, but... Beyond that, I think there's definitely that scope for it eating into some areas of commercial photography in particular. Look, I think it's I think it's going to change it. Yeah, it'll, it'll it, it's going to change things, but then digital change things. This is true, and even the, the traditional DSLR film camera changed things. We went from having to paint emulsion onto glass plates to yeah. you don't have to do that anymore so it changed things so things will change no question 
how photography is perceived will change. But that's also happened several times in the past. Mm -hmm. It will have impact on things like competitions and stuff. And I was on a call last night, a group call, where that conversation came up. It was about judging of competitions. And, yeah, it will change things because in a competition, if you think about, if we think about when we assess photography or we judge it yep. uh, and, and look at competitions, we can either judge the, the image, the final print. Here is a print. And if we're saying all I want you to do is judge the print, that's got nothing. It doesn't matter how it got there. That's what we're judging. But if we're judging the process or the yep. craft or the expertise of the photographer or the person who created the image, yep. then we say, okay, we, are we rewarding a computer or an algorithm or are we rewarding somebody's brain? Yeah. The reality is we've got more AI happening now that people realise or than, than they oh, actually absolutely. sometimes think about. Yeah. And when people go out and say, I did it all in camera, so it's natural, I laugh and I say, no, you're using more AI than I'm using because a lot of the processes are taken out of your hands and your computer camera is doing That's it for it. you. Exactly. And you're putting it forward as being more mechanical and natural. You're, you're letting no. Canon or Nikon or Fuji or whoever it is that it's your less. camera manufactures. You're to using make the more decision. AI than I'm using. That's right. You know, so I think it's already there. And one of the things I, and I'm not saying I'm right, but one of the thought processes that I've been going through and having discussions with people around is if we go back 50 or 60 years, then when we recognised photographers for their skill, we were recognising their ability to mechanically use the equipment. Absolutely. How technically good can you get it? Mm. And aesthetics came into it, but it wasn't really as valued as the technical expertise. Yeah. yeah. And then then we moved into where the cameras did, took away a lot of that burden and a lot of that responsibility. Yeah. We then started getting into the aesthetic of the image, the editing ability, the expression... Mm -hmm the expression of the score as Ansel Adams was once quoted as saying the negative is the score and the print is the performance so we went from recognizing the score and the ability to write the music if you like or to produce yeah. that into how do you express it yeah you know, your print what how did you print it how did you choose to dodge and burn and all of those things and then it digital it was an evolution of that where editing skills was what we we're recognizing and a lot of the argument and the complaints around things like AIPP competitions, a lot of photography print competitions were that we were starting to recognise digi graphic design, digital art. Digital art. art. Yeah. But digital art was an extension of photography. It was, Absolutely. hey, we can do it, so let's do it. And in, even the Ansel Adams of the day would have done it if they could have. Absolutely, yeah. So I looked at that and I thought, okay, if we were there and we're here, where are we going next? Mm. And I feel like part of the skill set that will be more widely recognised and valued is curation. Because if we have these algorithms that are producing all of these, these options and these versions and these permutations, mm -hmm. do you have the skill to recognise the ones that are good versus the ones that aren't? Yeah. Can you recognise the ones that an audience will respond to versus the ones that won't respond? Yeah. Yeah. And I think cura curatorial skills will start to become more important because we do that now. When you try to produce an exhibition or a book or even enter a competition, you sit down with a collection or a selection of work and your job is to go, okay, which ones are going to get the best response? Mm. Which ones will work? Which ones talk to each other? I'm yeah. putting together an ex uh, exhibition or an essay of work. Which ones connect best? That's curatorial skill. That's the ability to find narrative, to find connection. So I heard somebody talking on a, I don't know, if it was actually on the TV last night, the back end of somebody on the project, I think it might have been. And he was, okay. it must yeah. have been about AI. And he was talking about soul and almost like AI can't produce the mistakes. Can AI yeah. produce the humanity? And how do we keep the humanity in our image making? Because it's in the mistakes. And the Japanese have an art, and I've forgotten the name of it, but it's where they break a ceramic bowl and put it back together using gold or platinum or yep. silver. And that becomes more valuable because it's broken and put together. Yeah. And I think it's things like that, that when we look at art, can we see the humanity? Can we see the individual expression 
of a person coming through that work that's going to help it elevate it above AI. Absolutely. But we're also going to learn to incorporate AI in our work. And I think in the same way that when digital cam or DSLR cam cameras took over the mechanics and took the responsibility away, we could get more invested in the ability to see and find narrative mm -hmm. in the same way that the digital editing process took away the post-production problems and gave us the opportunity to produce more technically correct images, yeah. we could focus more on narrative and emotional content. I think as AI comes in, it's going to take away some of the more predictable areas and allow us to explore and to become better at the unpredictable and hidden layers that we sometimes stumble on as photographers. Yeah. And yeah. if we're lucky enough or work hard enough, become good at being able to actually create with intent. That's where I'm at, Grant. For yeah. me, my art, yeah. I'm trying to create emotive, evocative images and pieces intentionally. And it's not yeah. easy. No. That's what I'm trying to do. And if AI can help me do that, but still have my stamp and my signature on them, then maybe it's not a bad thing. Maybe not. I don't know. Interesting where we're going. What do you like to do when you're not out shooting? What do I like to do when I'm not out shooting? You mean out of photography? Yeah. Okay. I have three absolutely beautiful grandkids, a mm -hmm. five-year-old, five-and-a-half, four-year-old, and a, four a nine-month-old. The two oldest are boys who keep me on my toes, keep everyone on their toes. They are full ball. I love spending time with them because yeah. – and my other passion is the beach. Yeah. Being you know, my my catch cry, my elevator pitch when someone says what what's your what's your passion built around, it's this. I love the I, I love to witness the dance between the water and the light. Yeah. Water and light and the ever changing variations of it. Now, if I can bring spend time with my grandkids down the beach and watch my four year old grandson run running down the beach, jumping, splashing, creating digging that's just takes me back to the fact that the world is a wonderful place so yeah. that's what i love to do i love to explore new ideas i love listening to podcasts uh, i love exploring the science of human ex excellence yep um, people like uh, stephen kotler the rise of superman greg braden mm -hmm. who is a spiritualist and ph philosopher and physicist I, yep. I did physics at uni, right? so I've got that science background. I love music, absolutely adore music. Just went to a Led Zeppelin concert, which was obviously not the original band, but it had the original band drummer's son who runs okay. it. Okay, yep. And uh, absolutely brilliant two hours of Led no. Zeppelin music, which is from, from the 70s and 80s. But I love listening to Ed Sheeran. I love any music. I was a DJ for seven years when I was young. Yeah. So that music thing and putting music and visuals and experiences together. So I'm writing books. Obviously, there was a Gert by Sea project book, and I've, I'm doing a book on for my grandkids, which is about built around exploration and adventure and finding the best in yourself. I'm also been working on a book for a few years now, but it's coming close to finish, and that is a book on my aerial philosophy and work, which I can't wait to finish because. But as I get closer, there's more things I want to put into it, which is a challenge. Oh, sure. yeah. So, yeah, anything like that. And I, I love watching sport. I'm a sports nut, absolute nice. sports nut. Yeah. A Manchester United fan. I like skateboarding, um, but I'm not as good as Ian van der Waal, and I'm certainly not as good as the young ones. <laughs> and I, I have to say that one of the things I love, which is kind of part of my industry but not, is travel and meeting and interacting with my friends from different countries, whether it's online or preferably in person. So I've got a lot of friends overseas these days and I just love sitting down with them in not in busy places. To give you an insight into what I like to do, I often, when I'm in Vegas for conferences or places like that, I like going to a piano bar with just okay. a small group of people and just yep. sitting listening to the music nice. and having a quiet drink. So. Anything like that, I think that inspires and brings new ideas and thoughts and people watching, yeah. people watching. But yeah, keeping fit, eating cool. well, all that. Who else should I be talking to on the podcast? Are there any particular? Well, I'm going to confess, you... I can't recall everyone you've had, so I may come up with people you've. No, that's to. that's okay. 
if if you and do, I have to ask you the question: Is it is it purely landscape? It's called landscape photography world, so mm -hmm. I'd, it'd probably be a bit weird having too many portrait photographers sure, or wedding sure. photographers on. Have you had Steve Gosling on? No, I haven't had Steve. He's from England. Yep. Absolute gentleman. I'm guessing you've had Pete Eastway on. No, I haven't. He's on the list. I haven't asked him yet, but look, I think they're going to hit him up. Pete's one of the old school, but yep. there's not much Pete hasn't seen and hasn't done, and yep. I think. The thing I love about Peter is he brings such a broad background um, of experience mm. in terms of publishing, books, travel, and, of course, landscape. Uh, it's interesting we didn't talk much about competitions, but that background in understanding, and not competitions for the ego side and all of that, but for the growth side, for the challenging yeah. yourself. Yeah. We both have a strong passion in helping people challenge themselves. Christian Fletcher is an obvious one if you haven't had him. There's some, there's all the young guns. I think you've had Mika Boynton on. Yep, I have Mika yeah. on. Uh, when I say young guns, younger than me. Yeah, look, there's some guys who aren't pure landscape. They're more commercial, but so they probably don't fit. There's a guy in America, which be, and in, I, I don't know what he'd be like, but he'd be, he'd, he's old school, mm. but a guy called Ken Skloot. Okay, can't say I've heard of him yet. Yeah, really, like, does. Have a look, check it out, and you'll see his work, yeah, and you'll definitely. know if you like it. Mm. Uh, if you want, are you looking for people established or up people new and? I'm looking for people right across the spectrum. I've spoken to people with in interesting work, but very much at the beginning of their careers, through to people that have been in in the industry for thirty odd years. So anywhere in between, I'm looking first and foremost for the quality of the work? Does it engage me? And if it does, then I'm more likely to ask someone. But so that that work quality is first and foremost. But in terms of where they are in the industry or where they are in terms of their careers or, or whatever, I've had hobbyists, I've had professionals. So it, have, you, have you had Chris Saunders? No, I haven't had Chris yet. Uh, Chris is, is a, another gentleman, absolute gentleman and exquisite Brilliant. printer. Good, and obviously aerial fine arts, one of his, his mainstays, but yeah, he's, yeah. A, he's a lovely guy. Jordan Cantello? Yep. Or Jordan Cantello, sorry. Have you had Jordan? No, I haven't had him on yet. Oh, look, he's amazing. He does a lot of the lightning storms, mm -hmm. but he's he's he works with the fire. He's a fireman. Works okay. in, yep. does, in the aerial area, like he does a lot of fire when there's fires, he's in the air overseeing. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely bonzo bloke, top yeah. guy, and great photographer. I'd be chasing Jordan. All right. Because he's right smack in it. He's got a, quite a niche area that he's known for. Yeah. Thanks uh, for so that. So definitely go for Jordan. Clayton Hairs would be an interesting conversation for you. He's, he's a photographer, but he's also mixed media. Like he finished, yeah. it's how yeah. he finishes his work is quite interesting. So have a look at Clayton as well. Mm -hmm. uh, have you had Jackie Rankin? No, not yet. Talk to Jackie. Brilliant. Um, she's in New Zealand. She lives in uh, Twizel mm -hmm. in central South Island. Uh, Jackie is a does a lot of black and white, edgy landscape stuff. So definitely Jackie. And her partner is Mike Langford. But uh, either of those. But Jackie, I think Jackie, having some ladies on is a good thing. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm always looking on. There's a few for you, but you know, no, that, there's a lot out there. That's brilliant, mate. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I've got one more question for you, and for okay. many of the listeners, it's the most important one I ask because okay. it's a very yeah, it's a very deep and dark part yeah, of the sure. uh, photography world. Yeah, you yeah. Like What's my favourite drink pizza? or something, is it? <laughs> no, do you like pineapple on pizza? Yes. Good. <laughs> Good question. Yeah. There's some people that are... Uh, very against it, and I can't understand that myself. But diversity is the spice of life. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> All right, it's been really fantastic having you on the show today, Tony. And thank you for spending some time with us, letting us into your world a little bit. Where can people find your work? Instagram is Tony Hewitt, so that's one place. Or www.tonyhewitt.com. Easy. You'll see everything on there from what we've been exhibiting and showing and selling to all the workshops and experiences that I offer in terms of 
whether it's mentoring one-on-one or mastermind group or joining myself or myself and one of my mates or other photographers on a workshop tour, something like that. Brilliant. Uh, or just send me an email, have a chat. Fantastic. Thanks, Tony. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks again for listening to Landscape Photography World. I hope you enjoyed the show and keep listening because I'll be joined by some great guests in upcoming episodes. You can find my work in this podcast at grantswinburnphotography.com. I'm also on Vero, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. If you're interested in buying prints or photography gear or doing a photo workshop with me, these are now on sale on my website. I'm Grant Swinburne. Hope to see you out shooting soon.